Right. Um, can we go straight to the, um, the, the, the computer view? I'm, I'm the, not really very interesting in this. Um, no, stop. There we go. Right. So, um, yeah. Uh, who is vaguely familiar with Wireshark? Right. Okay, good. That, that's actually really good news because um, and I was putting the slides together for this, starting to put the slides together for this. I realized that pretty much every slide in it had a Wireshark capture in it. And I thought, well, really? I should just do the whole thing in Wireshark. So this is um, a presentation with no PowerPoint, no keynote. It is in, actually it's in Termshark, which is a really cute um, front end to Wireshark. Anyway, hopefully this will, this will work. So um, yeah, I'm Tim Panson. I'm the CTO at Pipe. At Pipe. Um, my Twitter handle is Steely Glint, and I'm Tim at Pipe. And I have a certificate, self-signed, mind you, but I have a certificate to prove it. So, um, right, I have another question. Um, who here runs, hands up, actually, taking Duffett's advice, who here, hands up, runs a media server within their organization? Okay. No, no, keep, keep, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Right, now, hands down if you already run video over that media server. Okay, so, you know, like, there's some uncertainties there. All right, thank you. Cool, so people, this is really aimed at people who've kind of done voice for years, and, uh, and this is my category, um, and are now, like, straying into video and thinking, hey, it can't be that hard, it's the same protocol. Um, it turns out that that's a drastic mistake. Uh, it, it really, whilst they are both RTP, um, it's not true that they are the same. So let's just look at. So the context of this is that I um, I wrote some software some eight years ago um, for Voxeo Labs as was, and um, it's just a very simple SRTP stack for doing audio that was originally in the, um, in the browser and then it kind of migrated to run as a front end in front of a media server, kind of taking out the WebRTC-ness and pushing it into a, 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 um, a media server that could handle voice but nothing else. And that, um, that software is open source. Um, and uh, as some of you know, like a couple of years ago, I did a talk here with a doorbell that was doing um, real-time audio over WebRTC from a light, small device um, up into a browser. And so I had the, and that was using the same stack. And I thought, like, you know, this is, this is fine. And then it cropped up that um, we wanted to do, like, real-time video for those sorts of environments. So we thought it would be, uh, I thought it would be pretty simple, actually. You just, like, you just connect to the WebRTC stack that we were already running on a Raspberry Pi. Um, and hey, you'll just get, you know, it'll be simple. You'll just get video out of it. And, um, and hopefully we will in a second. There we go. Um, so you do get video, and it does actually work. But it turns out that it is a staggering amount of work to get it to that point, to the point where it actually works at all. Um, and so what we'll do is walk through what it was that we had to do to make that happen. So. What next? What next? Yes, what is the core of this? It is um, RTP dot P, P type is 96. And that will fairly soon be um, nailed into your brain, I think, um, because it's a very common. Um, <laughs> No, oh, come on. No, plus, there we go. That's what we want. Right, so those are the first few packets of a video call um, from a WebRTC device running a pipe stack onto a small WebRTC device running a pipe stack onto into Chrome. And what you see, if you look at this, um, as compared with your normal voice call, is it's, like, it's actually drastically different, right? So the packet sizes are huge. 
Right? We're, we're nearly 10 times your, your uh, 7-Eleven packet size. Um, and, you know, and there are quite a lot of them. They're quite frequent. Like we've got in the first, what is it, 80 milliseconds, we've got eight packets. And they're all a kilobyte each, apart from a few at the beginning. And, um, and what you also see, if I shrink the screen a little, is that the timestamp doesn't change. Those first, whatever it is, 12 packets on the right-hand side of the screen have exactly the same timestamp. And then you get a packet with a mark bit, marker bit set, and then the timestamp changes. Now, the sequence number increments the way you'd expect, but the timestamp doesn't move. Like, what's going on there? And the answer is that actually video is just too big. Right? So what happens is it gets packetized, your, your, your frame, your still, if you think of it like that, gets packetized into multiple packets, and they are, all have the same timestamp on them, but then um, they're, so that the far end can aggregate them together as the same frame. Um, and then you mark the end of them with a, with, a times, with, a, with a marker bit so that you know that they're all associated. So um, there's a pretty big difference. And the subsequent packets you see, the, uh, or rather frames, are shorter. They're only a couple of kilobytes each. And those are, the first one is effectively a still, and then the subsequent frames are effectively just deltas from that frame. So you have, um, you know, what's changed, what's moved. And, it, and the, code, the codec, H.264 codec, is very clever about that. It'll do temporal changes as well as um, uh, visual, you know, horizontal or vertical changes. So it's like, it actually does, it's very clever about encoding that. Um, and I should say that one of the delights of the Raspberry Pi and actually a lot of the small ARM devices is the H.264 encoder is in hardware and free. So we can get like 1080p at 30 frames a second out of a $20 device, or actually a $10. The cheapest Raspberry Pi can still do that, um, which is kind of interesting. So um, the downside of all this is that if you drop a single packet, a thing goes to hell in a handbasket, right? So like, if you drop, and this is a particular packet, if you drop this packet, then the still is not there, so you can't, the, the decoder can't decode the still, and therefore the deltas are of no use to anybody because they're deltas from something it doesn't know about. So you now have like a frozen picture until the next time you get a full frame that comes through. So you can get this um, amazingly massive knock-on effect. I mean, think of it, it's like, kind of like a DDoS effectively, that you can, Dropping one packet, Let, let's say you're, you're watching two megabits of video, right? Um, and you drop one packet, you drop a, estimate a kilobyte, um, then actually the whole of the video for the next, let's say, one second is completely useless. So dropping one one kilobyte packet effectively drops you a quarter of a megabyte. So there's a 256 times multiplier on dropping a single packet. So dropping packets is fantastically expensive in terms of the user experience uh, and in terms of the bandwidth wastage. So like, this, is a, um, this is a huge revelation to me. Um, I, I kind of thought that it was going to be like Opus, where you drop a packet and Opus will figure it out. You know? Or, or 7-Eleven, where you get a slight audio glitch, but like, you carry on afterwards. So partly the human processing and partly just like the factors of the way the codex work means that's simply not true. Um, and that is pretty difficult. So what can you do to fix that? I mean, that actually, when you come down to it, like the whole of the thing, thing here is about how do you deal with lost packets? How do you cope with that problem? How do you mitigate that 256 time payout? So, um, the first thing you have to do is to have feedback, right? It's, it's, it's not possible, and, and, you know, in order to cope with this, you've got to know that it's happening. Um, so, the technique you use for that is RTCP. Now, it's possible to 
Um, now, I've switched PCAPs because RTCP is encrypted, and it's encrypted in a way that Wireshark can't easily decrypt, so I had to hand decrypt this so that you could see it. Um, and I should add that RTCP is, of all of the protocols I've ever implemented, RTCP is easily the most horrible. Like, it is the most unpleasant protocol. Badly, I mean, I'm, I know people who are involved in this, so I should be a little careful, but it, it like, it started out being fairly ugly, and then it's just been brutally misused over the years in ways that are horrific. Um, and if anyone wants to catch me afterwards, ideally with a beer, I can give you the full rant on why I think it's such an awful protocol. But anyway, um, fact remains, that is the protocol that we have for sending feedback between the sender and the receiver about what it is that they've seen. So um, now I probably need to shrink that one a little so that the packets come up above your headline. There we go. Um, where are we? So what that should do is, right, so this is a, this is a fairly dull, actually, packet, so let's go for something a bit more interesting, a bit further down. So you, what you get in, once things have started traveling, um, you'll get s receiver reports which say basically how much has turned up. Um, so here we get, uh, let's see, what do we get? So none have been lost. The fraction is of none lost. Cumulative are not are none lost because this is quite early on in the call, um, and and it also tells you what the highest number sequence is, so you can tell like how far behind. So the thing about this message is it's been sent by the receiver back to the sender. So the sender now knows something about the link and 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 what is being lost or not, and what the time delay is over the link. So. That's actually really useful. So that feedback, in principle, you could use that feedback and, and other sorts of feedback to like replay the packets that you'd lost. Um, and it turns out that that's probably not such a good strategy because what you're trying to do, in most cases, what you've, the reason you've lost packets is that the, um, you've hit saturation point of your path. Like between the sender and the receiver, you've pretty much, you probably hit saturation point. And you tried to go over it, and you're starting to lose packets because of that. And, and that may be because somebody else has, has infamously you know, decided to download YouTube or whatever. But in the end, it's to do with the fact that the path, there's a limited capacity on the path, and you're starting to lose packets. There are occasions when you lose packets because of other reasons, like randomly. But that's usually that's in the low percents you know, one or so percent on most functioning networks these days. And so what you're actually interested in here is, is, is not overloading an already overloaded network. So re retries, uh, in the, without doing something else as well, a retry just makes the situation worse. Because if, if you couldn't get your 20K iframe through, then sending it again, like, it's making the same mistake again. So it's unlikely to succeed. Um, and the chances are half of it still hasn't got there because it's still buffered somewhere. So like, that's actually not a, a brilliant strategy. There are some other strategies that are, that are looked at, um, and it was mentioned yesterday um, in, uh, in, as a question to Matt's talk. And I should thank Matt Fredrickson for having introduced a lot of this stuff. So I, kind of, I didn't have to cover a lot of the uh, background because Matt already talked about some of it yesterday. So. Um, there's OPFEC. So what OPFEC does is kind of like what Opus does. And it says, well, hey, um, let's try and fix the odd lost packet. So OPFEC is a, is a mathematical trick. Basically, you take two packets, and you XOR them, and you send all three. And the XOR, the idea is that if you lose the XOR, well, you don't care because you've got the other two. And if you lose one of the other two, but you still have the XOR packet, then you can XOR it with the one that you've got, and you get the one that you lost. Now, this sounds like a really good idea, but actually, pretty much it doesn't work under real circumstances. Because there's two observations, um, one of which is the thing about the bandwidth constraints. So if you look at that adult effect, basically, you're adding 50% of extra packets to the network to do that. 
and you ask yourself where if you're in a strain network constrained position, then you either have to wind back the amount you're encoding in the first place to like, you know, 60% of the, what the link's capable of, and then add ULPFEC on top of it, or you have to say, well, you know, it'll just work, and actually, realistically, it won't. So that's, that's one problem. And then the other problem, which I think is the real killer for ULPFEC, is that it assumes a certain pattern of packet loss, which just doesn't happen in real life, right? So ULPFEC, in order for an ULPFEC packet to be useful, you pretty much have to be able to fix it so the, 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 the XORD packet has to arrive within the time of that current frame. So think of it as, as 100 milliseconds, right? So if you're, if you're running at 10 frames a second, which is quite slow for video, then ULPFEC, the ULPFEC packet has to arrive in time for this frame. Otherwise, it's no use to you because you've already moved on to the next frame. What that means is that you have to lose a packet. You can't, you can't put the ULTFEC packet very far away from the original packets. And so any short-term break into your, into your connectivity, any short-term reduction in your throughput, or, or somebody walking out the door off one Wi-Fi station into another, like those sorts of breaks, ULTFEC can't help you with because you don't lose one or so packets. You lose 200 milliseconds worth of packets. And whether they were ULTFEC packets or not, like you've lost everything, like you've lost the whole chunk. So in, in effect, ULTFEC doesn't help in those environments. There are, of course, like satellite and other, other modulation environments where you may lose the odd packet here and there for which ULTFEC might be worth it. But I'm skeptical about it, that in general. All of which brings us to, well, how the heck does it work anyway? Like, how do, how do Google make Hangouts work? How does anybody make WebRTC um, video work? And the answer is by some really cunning maths. See, what you really want to do is to avoid the problem. Like, instead of trying to fix the problem, what you really want to do is stop it happening in the first place. And so what you do and, and what Google do in Chrome and everybody does in WebRTC, is to try and work out what the capacity of the link is and then surf just underneath it. Now, that sounds like magic. That sounds like, like voodoo. How do you know what the capacity of a link is? All right, well, it turns out that there are some clues. Um, and there's a really nice, mathematically crunchy um, draft RFC on REMB which uh, talks about this. And concise and probably inaccurate summary is that it looks at the arrival time of the packets. And if the inter-packet arrival time starts to grow, then you know that you're approaching a congestion point. And like, how do you know that? Well, the answer is that just as you approach congestion, something in the path is, the bottleneck item in the path is going to start buffering. And that adds just a millisecond or so of delay. And that's enough to trigger the fact that you know that you're heading into congestion. So the trick then is to get that message back to the sender to say, hey, we're heading into congestion. Back off. And at that point, you then go and hit the encoder. And you say to the encoder, you, know, you were running at 2 megabits. I want you to run at half a megabit, just temporarily. And then later, maybe you can ramp it up. And that information is conveyed in what is actually, I think, my Hall of Fame most Baroque packet, right? The REMB RTCP encrypted packet is, is, is the deepest, nerdiest packet I think I've ever done and it's seen, and it's the ugliest as well. Not least of which, the way that they encode the bandwidth figure, this bandwidth figure here, we're seeing that it thinks we've got around four megabits at this point. Um, it's encoded as a mantissa and an exponent. So the mantissa in this case is 2,000, uh, yeah, two, two, 2 megabit roughly. But then you multiply it by 2 because the exponent is 1. Right. I, I, it took me a long time to get the code right for that, but it does actually work. So what you do then, oh, there's, there's, one, other, there's one other strategy which I should to be fair, I should add, which is that, and you'll see that, I don't know if actually it's in this trace, maybe not. Um, let's have a quick peek. Which is that, 
are there any PLIs? No, I don't think there are any in here. But anyway, so there's, this, there's a point at which there are si situations where the decoder just says, I have no idea what's going on here. Like, what is all this? Um, and that's probably because it's late to the party. The most common thing here is it's joined an already existing call. Right, so ages ago, somebody sent a full frame and sent the encoder parameters and all the stuff it would have needed to decode this and hasn't bothered to repeat it like because everybody involved in the call already know it. But at this point, somebody new joins and has no clue about what the image looks like. And so the deltas are no use to it. And at that point, the decoder says, help. And what you do is you send a packet loss, a full frame request. So you basically send a, a request back over RTCP saying, hey, just send me a full frame, will you? And there are a couple of strategies here for you can either tell the encoder to do that, so you can go and hit the hardware encoder and say, send, start this full frame, start with a new full frame. Or you can do what the SFU people do, which is to cache an old one. Like, you know, you get one every few seconds anyway, and if you send one that's a little bit old, it's probably good enough to get things going, and then it'll fix itself within the first few, few seconds. So if you, if you go to some of the SFU um, conference, video conferencing sites, the first like half second, the image is a little glitched, and that's probably because it's got an older, um, the, the iframe it's starting from is not totally in sync with the deltas that are turning up. And then after a, a, a second or so, it'll, it'll settle. But you still you have the benefit of actually getting an image that's roughly right. It's got the right people in it. The colors are right. It just, some of the movement may be screwed. So, um, so that's a knack or, or, or one of the other PLI um, requests. So I, I've talked a lot about the theory of this, um, but it's time for a foolish demo. Right, so it, this, this has been um, sitting here. Hopefully, um, yeah, still working. And I'm dri incidentally, I'm driving this over, um, over WebRTC as well. Like, there's a data channel um, between us. I wonder if I can get myself in my own picture. No, wrong way. There we go. Cool. Right, so um, now, Chrome, wonderful. Um, let's have a look. If I, can I find bandwidth estimate? So yes, there we go. So this is what Google thinks the available bandwidth is on the link between here and there, which is actually running on a hotspot on my phone. Right, so it thinks it's around 2 megabit, which is probably reasonable for like the Wi-Fi distance and the noise in the room and whatever. Um, and, and if you look at what the encoder is actually generating, it's somewhat less than that, but it peaks towards that. So the encoder is staying within the the bounds I've asked it to be in. Okay, that, that's, that's kind of cute. It's detected a sensible range and it's, and it's working. But now let's do something really stupid. Let us simulate the condition that I walk out the door and move from Wi-Fi to 3G. So what you want to watch what happens to this 2 megabit. Now, nominally, this is, off, is going to offer 768 kilobit when we move to 3G. So let's do that and see what happens. And it's failing miserably. Why? Why are you doing this to me? No. What have I done wrong? Yeah. It's... I think it's presenter mode. I think you can't do this. I think Apple are protecting me from my own stupidity. Um, that's, that's, right, duff it, take that one off on the list. I didn't test this with a projector. Um, normally, what would happen at this point, um, I wonder if I can simulate it. So what we'll do is we'll, oh, there we go. It's, what took you so long? And now it's died completely. Okay, that's, this is a failing demo, but it's kind of interesting. Um, and in fact, yeah, we've lost the link completely now. It does actually normally work, as, as witnessed by the fact that your calls actually t typically go through um, successfully. 
So, um, right. What would happen... Now, let's just disable this again and see whether it comes back. Um, right. What... Um, what I now want to say is, is really, had this worked, I would have said the fact that it works is a minor surprise, actually, because the whole thing is, is, um, is an arcane set of messy protocols layered on top of each other that weren't designed for doing this. And what you see is that the, if you look at what Google are doing in the WebRTC space, is they're starting to look at putting a new real-time protocol in based on Quick because this is something they, the, the, the consensus within the engineering community is that this is probably not a good long-term solution. As bandwidths and packet sizes for or frame sizes for video go up and up and up to 4K and beyond, like, RTP is not going to be the right vehicle for it. It's fine for the moment. Well, actually, I argue it probably isn't. But anyway, so you're starting, you should start to look in the future at something like Quick for RT. Um, which is still UDP-based, but it has a different set of, 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 of rules. And I should make a huge thank you to these folks who... So this is a Twitter group, and actually Fippo, who isn't in this, in this Twitter group, but um, this is a Twitter group of people who've been um, immensely supportive of me in, the, in, this, in this game of trying to get this stuff working. Um, I've asked dumb questions, and they've come back with good answers. And, and one of my favorites was that we, I said, we're like, I want to run this in a particular circumstance. And they said, um, which was that I wanted multiple receivers from the same uh, one encoder. And they said, you do know you're building an SFU. I said, well, not really. He said, yeah, no, actually, that's an SFU. OK, so this is the thing of that Raspberry Pi is an accidental SFU. But no, a huge, seriously, a huge shout out to, to these guys. Um, for their support in this and, and answering my dumb questions and, and giving me pointers to relevant RFCs and whatever. Um, and the relevant RFC that you really need to read is REMB, but drink some coffee first because it's pretty deep. Oh, one more thing. Before we, before we go, I have one more thing, which is that we need to get back to where we started. Which is because you need to kind of close the loop, I'm told. Otherwise, you won't know where to send the complaints, which, is, as Duffett says, you, you always need a good feedback channel. And so in this case, if you can dig into the signed certificate in the DTLS handshake, what you'll find is that, where are we? I issued it as well because it's self-signed. What you'll find is that I am still, even after that disastrous demo, I'm still Tim Panton at Pipe, and that's still my email address. There we go. Right, thank you. Good. Questions around here? Anyone? Okay, so my question then for um, video in the future as we get uh, higher and higher resolution, do you think there will be something uh, like new technology or will just rely on uh, better bandwidth so in infrastructure, you see some algorithms for you know, compressing better, but still giving us proper uh, feature. Is any work in that direction you are aware of, or what I? It, it, I there's some talk about doing actually s less clever, less subtle codecs, but that you can implement better in GPUs. So there's a there's a. Um, and I can't remember the name of it, somebody may, may remember it, but there's an effort to, Im to write a codec essentially in WebGL, right? And so, so that you can leverage the GPU on like anything, and you just, the JavaScript will just send the parameters to the WebGL and go do it. I haven't seen the results of that, but people are quite positive about it. 
from Dragos. Yeah, I have, a, I have two questions actually. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so you you stated that ULP fake doesn't work, and I dare to contradict you, <laughs> because there are three arguments here. You have to increase your jitter buffer. That's one. Two. You have to use what what's called the multi fake. So is the idea of using a certain type of masks and a certain type of uh, group size. I mean, if you read the RFC, I guess you know. And uh, the other one is the re-recovery mechanism. So it kind of makes it work because of that, because if you recover one packet, you can recover even more after that. And the other question <laughs> is uh, if you can explain a bit better the differences between RMB and Transport CC. Right, right. So um, the first thing about OPFEC, like I stated my opinion. I'm actually not an expert, right? But what I will tell you is that Google aren't interested in it. Right? And, and then they're putting what appears to be zero effort into it. And they have literally millions of calls a minute over WebRTC, and they collect the stats on most of them. Are the stats don't work. <laughs> are you sure the stats are working correctly in WebRTC when it comes to ULP fake? Uh, and I, <laughs> I, I, all, all I'm saying is that they have better data than I do, and they're not interested. Yeah. And, and to be honest, and the, the other way to look at that is if they're not interested and it's not interested, it's not going into Chromium, but then it really... it is in Chromium. It is in Chromium. Yeah, no, but then I, I, I'm not and aware of them work. putting any development effort into it. And that scares me. Like, you shouldn't be following something that Google aren't interested in, yeah, yeah. given that there's really only one browser that doesn't, isn't based on that source code. Yeah, very good point. How about FlexFec? We had a discussion also about uh, FlexFec. I'm, so, so the, your other question about uh, Transport CC. So, what Transport CC does is it, or if what I understand it does, is it adds more accurate timing. So, I was saying that 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 spread of of the buffer of the timing of the arrival packets. What you can also do, if you know the time it left and the time it arrived, you can get a measure of the of of the time of flight. And if you can see changes in the time of flight, as well as timing between pa inter packet then that gives you much more interesting, interesting and faster feedback. I think particularly, as Matt was saying, not so much on the downside, because you can catch that quite easily, but seeing that you could, could ramp up. Um, and, and the code I've got at the moment doesn't do Transport CC, and it ramps up very slowly. Um, so, so I think Transport CC is probably something I should be doing, and Google are interested in it. So that's, that's a strategy for going. And maybe the rest of it will. A great, great insight. Thank you very much. Thank you, team. Let's continue outside. If